Well, of course, we are in the COVID era. We don't know how long this is going to last. And so uh, a very common question that comes up from our, our patients with CLL is, what impact does this have on them? Are they more susceptible? Uh, you know, the natural things that people want to know. With CLL in general, there probably is some compromise to the immune system, but it's really hard to measure or quantify. Certainly individuals who've had a lot of chemotherapy in the past, who have advanced disease, are, are more susceptible to infections. In contrast, someone who's uh, without symptoms, has a low burden of disease, probably is close to being like somebody who doesn't have CLL. So there's, current, there's, there's certainly a spectrum. So really we just try to uh, advise uh, following the guidelines that we all are following uh, in terms of uh, avoiding uh, you know, social distancing at present, uh, being aware of uh, being around others uh, too closely or, or those who may have symptoms. Uh, so I think in a way, uh, what everyone is doing now is something that is uh, beneficial to patients with CLL and, and, and certainly other cancers with respect to infection uh, risk. Now, what about, uh, do we have any information? Is somebody with CLL more susceptible to getting COVID? What if you do uh, uh, get the infection? Is it going to be more severe because you have underlying CLL? And at least in, in general terms, the answer seems to be no. Uh, that's really just based on experience, anecdotal experience, uh, certainly in areas like New York City or, or Italy, for example, where infectious rates have been quite high. Colleagues have commented that their patients don't seem to be um, more ill uh, simply because they have the underlying disease or uh, because they're on a, a certain uh, treatment, for example. There's actually some very interesting uh, data suggesting that perhaps the BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib and calibrutinib, et cetera, might actually uh, confer benefit, uh, might lessen some of the consequences of the infection. And as a result, uh, large clinical trials have started uh, for patients without CLL. Just anyone who has a significant COVID infection uh, who's hospitalized, they're, they're testing that hypothesis. So it'll be very interesting to see what we learn from this, uh, perhaps what we'll learn is that uh, being on a, a drug like that might actually be uh, beneficial. It's, it's certainly natural to be uh, hesitant to uh, come into a healthcare facility uh, because of the, the risk of infection. And, and certainly that's gonna vary quite a bit uh, depending on where you are at, at the height of um, the pandemic in New York City, of course, uh, a lot of concern on the part of patients going into a, a hospital clinic, for example, um, whereas at, at our institution, the impact has been um, quite low. Uh, and uh, all institutions, of course, have taken per any precautions they, they can to limit exposure. So I often, I've often told my patients that it's, it's probably safer to come into our uh, clinic and get your blood drawn or, or see someone if you need to, then going to the grocery store, for example, um, in terms of exposure. But you know that's very different than saying the same thing in the, in the middle of New York City. So I, I think um, you, know, you have to deal with each situation uh, as it arises, and one would hope that your physician can give you guidance. And I think in particular, uh, what we can do is really decide how important it is to see somebody in person or have them come in and get a lab test there. Uh, I think in many, many, many cases that, that can be avoided for the time being. So, uh, and that, that also is an important point that we can provide reassurance that, you know, you're used to coming in every four months or every six months and having things checked. And um, uh, if, in many cases, we can reassure that individual that it's okay to wait. Uh, it's not critical to get that information uh, right now. So remember that uh, what, what we often emphasize in evaluating someone and making decisions about when to treat is, is three things. It's how you feel, what your exam is like, and what your blood counts look like. So of course, you know how you feel. Uh, has something changed? Are you having night sweats or 
a lot more fatigue? Is it, is it significantly different? And then of course, you typically know if anything's changing with your exam. Uh, you know, your lymph node's getting enlarged. Uh, do you notice a discomfort in your abdomen um, because of an enlarging spleen? And, and, and so, you know, two of the three things you can sort of self-assess in a way, and then based on what your, um, your blood counts have been showing over time, your physician can, can factor that in and decide how important it is to get that test now. And, and as I mentioned, in many, many cases, it's uh, perfectly fine to, to delay that. So uh, it's not as difficult as it might seem uh, to you to, to be able to come up with a reasonable assessment uh, about how somebody uh, might be doing, uh, even in the absence of seeing them and, and doing an exam in person. Mm -hmm.